Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first lecture of the ACT's Fall 2015 lecture series towards a philosophy of the act. I'm Gediminos Sorbonas, director of the MIT program in art, culture, and technology. In 2005, when the Monday night lecture series was launched, it aimed to bring together artists, cultural practitioners, and scientists from different disciplines to discuss artistic methodologies and forms of inquiry at the intersections of art, architecture, science, and technology. Over the last 10 years, we have developed this series, expanding our scope, continuing to invite the critical thinkers and cultural producers of our time to come together to address current issues and contemporary challenges. Our fall 2015 lecture series toward a philosophy of the act brings together a selection of artists, filmmakers, and cultural producers across the disciplines of art, pedagogy, architecture, and urbanism to focus on method as embodied experience, engaging the MIT community and beyond through praxis in relation to themes of architectural simulacra, economies and systems, constructed realities, participatory design, and designing social systems, collective production and sites for conversation, spatial practices of the commons, and rhizomatic platforms of exchange, and the problematic of teaching art, teaching as an artistic problem. The title, Toward a Philosophy of the Act, refers to the early work of Bakhtin that meditates uh, on the difference between physical and mental acts, live experience versus representation of experience. At what point does experienced reality depart from representation? What are the corporeal consequences of living or performing artistic methodologies outside of traditional context. Bakhtin described act as uh, postupok. Is there anyone who speaks Russian here? Who understands Russian? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But you understand what postupok means? Okay. With a focus on the physical act and the immediacy of experience, uh, this series is structured in a round table format, whereby the invited lecturer first presents their work, followed by a discussion featuring faculty, students, and experts, responding to the themes and challenges around the practice presented. Conceived by myself, a city director, this lecture series is coordinated by Amanda Moore, a city alumni from 2011, in the dialogue with a city students. This evening, we are very pleased to begin our series with a lecture by artist Maryam Jeffrey, featuring a response from Smarks candidate in MIT's history theory and criticism program and curatorial assistant. Asian Art at Solomon Guggenheim Museum, Shaare Ju Novel. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by SMAC candidate Gedney Barclay. An artist with a background in theater and performance, Barclay's process is grounded in extensive research and structured improvisations with the body and voice. She works between video, photography, and theater to study why, when, and how physical experiences are broken down described and refigured across different media. Barclay earned her BA in African American Studies and Theater, Wellesley University, and has since received numerous oh. honors, including CEC Artsling Grant in 2014 and Andrei Tarkovsky Institute for Sacred Arts Artist in Residence in 2014. As tonight's moderator, Gertney Barclay will introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Gediminas, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be able to moderate our first lecture series this school year, um, entitled Towards the Philosophy of the Act. ACT is a very diverse community, which is something that I love about it, but one thing that I think that we all share is a great concern over the ethics of practice and production. 
as students here, we're often obliged, or actually, we are completely obliged to ask the question, according to what demands and desires and powers is something made? For whom? By whom? How are ideas, ideologies, histories, and memories, things we often imagine as immaterial or intangible, manifest in our actions, in what we do, and also in our materials, our objects, and our architectures? And how do we account for all the transactions, excuse me, microphone, how do we account for all the transactions and exchanges that go into making something or practicing something in a globalized marketplace where the processes of production, consumption, and communication stretch over vaster and vaster differences at faster and faster speeds? I can imagine no better speaker to uh, elucidate and challenge these kinds of concerns than Mariam Jaffrey, tonight's speaker. Her work in video, performance, and photography rigorously question the cultural and visual representation of history, politics, and economy. Over the last year, she's investigated the connections between the production of goods and the production of desire, the elaboration of historical narratives through a post-colonial perspective, the effects of globalization on working conditions, and the, recently, the political stakes of food networks in her piece, Mouthfeel. Informed by a research-based and interdisciplinary process, her artworks often marked by a visual, oh, I'm sorry, are often marked by a visual language that is posed between film and theater, a series of narrative experiments oscillating between script and document, fragment and whole. Uh, the list of her exhibitions is exhaustive and very impressive, uh, including solo exhibitions at the Kunsthalle Basel, the Betten Salon in Paris, Gasworks in London, Bielefeld der Kunstverein in Bielefeld, Gallery Nova in Zagreb, and the newer Berliner Kunstverein in Berlin. Her work has also been seen in international exhibitions like the Belgian Pavilion at the 56 Venice Biennale, uh, the Contemporary Image Collection Collective in Cairo, Camera Austria, Manifesta 9, and the 2012 Shanghai Biennial and Taipei Biennial, among many, many others. Um, our respondent tonight, Zhao Ri Zhu Noel, is equally well versed in the politics and structures of production in art and culture. Uh, as Gedimir has mentioned, she's not only a curatorial assistant in Asian art at the Guggenheim, a master's candidate in history, theory, and criticism of art and architecture at MIT, but she is also notably the teaching assistant for our uh, studio class at ACT, and we consider ourselves very lucky to have her with us in that class and here tonight, for sure. Her research focuses on the collective practices of the 1990s and 2000s, the impact of globalization on design and aesthetics, post-colonial feminisms, and conditions of labor and production of contemporary art in China. Uh, as was mentioned, she was also recently the research curator for the 14th Istanbul Biennial, Saltwater, A Theory of Thought and Forms. Uh, Jari, thank you so much for being here. Let's give it a round of applause. Uh, I think I've talked enough, so uh, now will you join me in warmly welcoming our lecturer tonight, Mariam Joffrey. Thank you very much for that intro. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all, and I will talk for about an hour, and then we will have a moderated conversation, and then hopefully open it up to the floor, which is super important. Um, I will show two works, I think, possibly three. Uh, they're quite different from each other, and yet not, and I will make some connections between the works. Um, so let's start with a photo work. I should mention I've been working for many years, so and I've chosen for this talk to, fo to kind of focus very kind of closely on a couple of key pieces. Um, so the first work I'm going to present is uh, was in Venice this year. Some of you may have seen it at the Belgian Pavilion. And it is a series of works called Getty versus Ghana, Corbus versus Mozambique, um, Musée Getty versus Musée Royal d'Afrique Centrale versus Congo, and Getty versus Kenya versus Corbus. So I will show, here's a detail. Um, and let me explain. <clears throat> Maybe I should actually backtrack and talk about the background a little bit and how I got to this work. 
Um, in 2009, I initiated a kind of long-term research project going through archives um, called Independence Day 1934 to 1975. That was a, um, and that is focusing on the moment of independence of various Asian, African, and Middle Eastern countries. So the first date of independence. So what I like to call that 24-hour twilight period from when a nation state, from when a territory transforms into a nation state. I think you'll remember we were in a show together and I showed an early version in 2010 in Norway. Actually, it's grown since then, but in any case. And one of the key aspects of that Independence Day work, it's a photo work, um, is that the archives, the photos come from archives from the countries themselves. Super important. So when I first started the project, people were like, but why don't you just go to London or Paris or Brussels or, you know, there's nothing there in these African countries or wherever or Asia. It's it'll probably in really bad states, blah, blah. But that was actually the whole point. And at this point, I'm up to like 30 archives or something like that. And it's super, super interesting. So what happened was, I, I don't always go to the archives, and, but I know that uh, sometimes I work with researchers in various countries, everything from you know Mozambique to Tunisia to Kuwait to India to Indonesia, um, so on and so on, Malaysia, so on and so on. Aunt Jordan, you know, et cetera, Kenya, Ghana. And the interesting thing about working this way was that I know the archives in these countries very well, particularly the images they're conserving, or not, of their independence day. So what happened was in 2012, I said, you know, just for fun, I'm like, okay, you know, um, this, it's great, I'm doing this work and it's interesting, but let me just go look online. I mean, most people, these are archives that are not very visible, they're fragile, you know, and dispersed throughout these various countries, public archives mostly, but let me look online as the way most people get their information, right? Um, let, let's just see what's online. Let's look at Getty, let's look at Corbis, just to see, um, you know, what there is. And to my shock, I came across the bigger image, the one that's less contrasty, online, and that was on the Getty image website with their copyright on it. And this is an image that if you see it once, you don't forget it, right? It is Kwame Nkrumah dancing with the Duchess of Kent, who's a representative of Queen Elizabeth. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's an image you have once, you see it once, you don't forget it. This image I had seen personally in the Ministry of Information in Accra in Ghana. And remember, Ghana, it's super important. It's the first sub-Saharan African country to become independent, 1957. And I, you know, I never, I wound up not using this particular image in my Independence Day work, but I remembered it. And I kind of, um, from the Minister of Information, I had, um, I kind of, you know, the public images, I ordered uh, all, all of the, Im you know, the from the negatives, I ordered some copies, and I have this image, the, the contrasty one, which comes from Ghana, the Ministry of Information, with their copyright stamp on the back. All copyright, Ministry of Information, Ghana, P.O. Box, blah, 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 Accra, Ghana, all rights reserved. So immediately, right, I had, I saw a very, very interesting um, set of dualities, right? On the left, which is the Ghana image, we have analog, digital, offline, online, public, private, um, African, South, global South, whatever you, term you want to use, multinational, corporate, American origin, but at this point, multinational, corporate. So you had a set of dualities, and this really interested me. It also put me in an odd position, of course, as an artist, because, and remember, these two entities are not working together. Getty is not selling on behalf of Ghana these images. Getty claimed the copyright, and as anybody who's worked with Getty knows how hardcore they are and insane about copyright, and Ghana claimed the copyright. So this was very interesting, and this started off a certain research process where I started comparing certain, Im um, what Getty and Corbis had to see if there were other overlaps and what was occurring. Um, formally, I will, show an, I will show another, actually let me, here, let's get to another image. Here again we have Ghana and Getty. 
And you know, this is super, this is super interesting. In my work, for me, two, two, two things I should point out about this Im these images. Um, what's, for me, form and content are super related, right? It's not easy to separate one from the other. So even when you see this juxtaposition, of course, I'm talking particularly about ownership informa of information. But m and remember, these are not just any images. These are foundational images of their nation state, this, that decolonial moment, right? Supposedly of independence or liberation, right? It's not just any random images. And what drew me, well, there was a couple of things that really drew me to this project also. I like to think also art historically. So, of co so for, of course, for me, it was super interesting how there was an older museological debate about cultural heritage. If you think about it, going to the British Museum, Elgin, Mar Elgin Marbles, and all that, about um, patrimony and repatriation. And this is kind of for the digital age. We're not dealing with statues, we're dealing with information. And of course, information, digital information can be replicated. But this was a super, but, but the fees and the profits are fl still flowing one way. So there's still hegemony involved and some kind of ownership. But this, this to me was super interesting. As I said, it was a kind of updating. So this piece is very much about the archive, but not going, look, uh, not to talk about the past or what could have happened, what should have happened, but rather it's actually looking very much into the future in terms of digitalization, ownership, and also what is online, what is offline, and if you're offline, are you completely invisible? Um, so this, so, so this, this is um, some key things for me. The second thing was, as I said, in terms of form, okay, you know, it's interesting. Here we see just some crop, see some cropping. And it's not Getty, I should make it very clear that this piece also traces, is very much tra tracing the provenance of where these images come from and how Getty, for example, wound, wound up owning these images. And I kind of trace that through the text. Um, but go, getting back to the cropping, you know, it's for photojournalism, it's probably in the 1957 in some magazine, um, life, whatever, they cropped it, they made it, but look, and you know, to fit the page, blah, blah, blah. But actually, through this juxtaposition, one of the things we also understand very clearly is how forms have ideologies. And in this case, what really are they saying? Um, the, the photojournalist who maybe unconsciously just cropped it to make it look better and fit the page. What they're saying is that history is about individuals and not about context. Because you always crop, uh, you crop out the social, the background, the crowd, the masses, and you focus in on who were allegedly the principal actors of history. And more than that, of course, we can see by the framing, the focus again is on the Duchess of Kent, and Nkrumah is kind of just like a bystander. And that's something that's going through all the images, by the way, in a lot of these Independence Day images, which is super interesting. So again, the links between form and content, particularly in my work, are very kind of close, or one kind of implicates the other. Visually, what I decided to do, or formally, is I kind of, these images are just kind of stuck straight up. I'm gonna zoom in. The top is Getty versus Ghana, and then there's a couple of other works which I'll get to. The images are stuck straight up on the wall, like as is, as information, and then the text is framed. Because for me, this piece is really about, in a way, my intervention is really, is about contextualization, the caption. So. And the images, as I said, I frame them as I get them. I mean, I put them up as I get them. No, you know, I don't alter them, and they're just kind of printed very simply, very kind of, and just stuck straight on the wall. Let me see what is, uh, okay, let me just actually go back. No, actually, I will forward it. Um, here's another one called Getty versus Kenya versus Corbis. Now, this is super, um, this is slightly, this is functioning slightly differently. I mean, it's a related piece. And as you can see, the difference is that the two images are not the same, right? This, my guess is it's two photographers next to each other or near-ish each other snapping at different times, right? And the top is from Getty and the bottom is from Kenya Ministry of Information. And again, I remember this image, so when I saw it online, I was like, aha. Bingo, another one, gotcha, you know, another one. Because I, I had this image, the actual photo, with the stamp, the back from the Ministry of Information. And uh, what interested me about this piece was, I, start, I, you know, I just wanted to see again how what 
how what Getty, um, how they acquired it, which I discussed, like which archives they bought in order to acquire this image. Because remember, they buy like 20 million at a 30 million images at a time. And also, what interested me was the, so I talk about provenance again, and also the the dating. This is super interesting because if you go online, you look at this image. Getty says it's the um, salute, a swearing in ceremony during independence, December 12, 1963. If you get this from the Ministry of Information, Kenya, they will say it's um, self-rule June 30th, 1963. So there's, so in terms of dating, there's a bit of a slippage. I, in my text, it's quite short, as I said, I talk about the provenance, and then I discuss who could or could not be right. You know, again, I, it's pure speculation what could or, you know, who could or could not be right. I mean, there's no way I can prove it. But I was very interested in, as I said, these kind of uh, slippages between dating and caption. And um, I speculate, you cannot see it so well here, but if you look at the chair, there is the insignia of Queen Elizabeth II on it. So I speculate that it's probably internal self-rule and probably not Independence Day um, swearing in ceremony. But that image is the one that you see a lot of the, of the swearing in ceremony of independence. So for example, in that book that Oakwe did on the African, the short century, you'll find this very similar image and they captioned it as independence um, because I think he'd used Drum Magazine's archive, which is a South African archive. And that's very interesting because if you go to the source, the Ministry of Information, they're saying it's self-rule. And my guess is actually, because I know the images, it probably is self-rule, but then, um, but again, there's no way of really proving it. But it's interesting the way, uh, you know, this, that image then becomes the icon for independence, Kenyan independence. And the bottom image, I just thought, well, let me just take a look at Corbis and see what they have. And at the bottom, they, uh, it's a small image. They say this is um, independence, this is from Independence Day, the swearing in ceremony. And he's wearing similar clothes, but, you know, it's not so clear here. But when you see it, you can see, again, they've cropped out and it, that it's at a stadium. And my guess is that's actually probably is more accurate, the um, thing. So th these are some, these are two of the works. There's four pieces in the series. But uh, these are two of the works um, in it. Oh yeah, here's the installation view. So we have Corbis versus Mozambique, Getty versus Kenya versus Corbis, Getty versus Musée Royal d'Afrique Centrale versus um, Congo, and then Getty versus Ghana. And one of the things sometimes people are, ask me, but, but what's your point? Or do you think Getty's or Corbis, they're doing this on purpose? My whole point is actually, point is actually, I don't, it's not on, my interest is not on purpose or who is doing what on purpose. It's not about agency. I see it as much more structural. Um, you know, when Corbis acquired the famous Bettman archive, um, Otto Bettman, the first image bank in, actually in the world, Otto Bettman said, well, they now own the whole visual history of the 20th century and all the iconic moments. So this, this is also, for me, extremely important in terms of ownership and how things are acquired. And as an artist, I'm particularly interested in it for two reasons. First, uh, you know, when you, we are working as research-based, let's say as research-based artists with images, if a lot of them are, a lot of the iconic images are owned from, you know, there's a, the information pipelines are very, very narrow. There's a few oligopolies, um, image oligopolies that own these, um, uh, visual information, then of course as an artist, I mean just even on a practical level in terms of licensing, in terms of fee, and in what you can do, this is something that directly impacts me and other visual creators. And of course also um, in terms of a lot of my um, curator friends, when they're doing let's say research-based exhibitions, half their budget is going on paying, you know, licensing images from these two or three image banks. Um, so that's super, so that's something that super interested me. Um, and this was also, as I said, yeah, a strong motivation. And it really irked me because with the Belgian Pavilion, Venice being as bureaucratic as it is, and that's a whole nother discussion, we actually had to buy image rights and that was most of my budget. We, I, and it really irked me because I had image rights, let's say with the Ghana one of the dancing. I mean, I actually have the photo and it's like $5 licensing fee, as I say in the text. But then, of course, we also, they were so like, no, 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 we have to get it from Getty. So then, I, you know, I was like, fine, it's not my money, you want to spend it, you can spend it. So, you know, um, we had to pay the licensing fee to Getty. So this kind of also put me in this strange, you know, thing where most of your budget is going, as I said, to these um, 
these, comp these private corporations. And you'll also see a lot of like, it's interesting again as a visual artist, you know, um, you'll see a lot of history books where, um, you know, academics uh, are writing the history of something. And it's super freaky because mo most of the images you'll see are very often from like a single often pri um, commercial archive. I mean, not always depending on who the researcher is and what they're researching, if they're researching uh, you know, fragile at risk archives that absolutely will not be the case, but if it's just like general text, you will often, you know, very often you will see that. And it's very interesting because academics, if you were a historian and all your um, information, your text came, your research came from one source, you would say that's not good scholarship. But somehow on the visual level, you can get away with that. And that also, this kind of blind spot also in terms of academic research was something that also really interested me. So there were a lot of, yeah, interests that kind of coalesced in, around this work. Mm -hmm. What is going, ah, yeah. Okay, um, in the interest of brevity and opening up the conversation, I think what I will do is I will um, now show a video. And this video is, on this, and in fact, in some ways, quite different. I, my work, I kind of, um, you know, I, it's uh, it formally and even uh, even in terms of thematically, it can be quite diverse. Um, so I will sh I will show a video. Um, it's called Avalon, and I will just introduce it very quickly by saying it's a single channel piece. Um, and I, it's, it's meant, even though it's single channel, it's installed in a space. Normally I load screening, but you know, it's okay for students in a student context. But no, because sometimes you get invited to film festivals and all that, and it's like, no, because that, that's a whole nother debate. But anyway, so that's just my little gripe here, but that's okay for, as I said, within an educational context. But just remember that even though it's a single screen, it's meant to be experienced in a space, non-linearly very often, and everything's in a loop. My stuff is always very short, but I actually like it if people watch it a couple of times because it tends to be quite dense. Anyway, so this, vi this video is called Avalon. Um, a few years back, I came across a story. I'd read about it in some newspapers. I'd also heard about it from people. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with it, of um, certain factories that produced um, in Asia that produced uh, leather SM fetish goods for, high -end, for export to high-end dungeons in the West, um, like role play items and props and costumes and things like that. And, um, and what was interesting about a couple of these factories, there, there's more than one, was the, in one particular country, and I never mentioned names, places, countries, whatever, um, so I'm not gonna say who, what, where, when, why, and how, but what was interesting was that the women, you know, it's a garment industry, the women working on these items were not told what, because of cultural or s religious taboos, were not told what it is they were working on. So they were told you're making, you know, props for circus animals or, you know, uh, you know, what's it called? Straight jackets, et cetera, for mental patients, blah, blah, blah. And uh, this really interested me because for, for a couple of reasons, right? The First was that um, being interested in labor, of course. What really interested me was that the typical, I wanted to use this fa these factories as a model. First of all, the typical kind of hierarchy between um, own management and workers here in terms of pay and in terms of the ability of, uh, and in terms of, uh, the ability of autonomy over work and the ability to structure one's day. I mean, that typical kind of hierarchy or co conflict between management and workers here was exacerbated by a third element, which was knowledge. So you have a mostly male management that knows, or more or less, and then you have a mostly female workforce that know, does not know or at least plays along and pretends not to know. So it might be a don't ask, don't tell kind of situation. It's not quite clear, but this really interested me. The second thing for me was that um, my work is often about relations and flows and dualities or 
net nodes or networks. And one of the things that really interested me was I saw parallels between between the way these items were produced and the secrecy and the kind of role play involved in that and the kind of the way those objects were consumed, let's say, in, in the world of the dungeon, the SM dungeon. And the kind of role playing, the, division, the gender division of labor, where you have a mostly male clientele, mostly female service providers, and also the kind of secrecy that surrounds that world and that sort of uh, sexual identity. So this was, so that became the starting point. Um, let's look at it, let's get the lights a little down. Is that possible? Oh, there you go. Okay, so um, let me continue. Can we get the lights up? So this, as you can see, it's made with staged and unstaged footage with um, a voiceovers. And, <clears throat> and we have sort of five scenes. Each one is narrated by, from a s different perspective. Um, so we, sort of five viewpoints, let's say, entrepreneur, designer, sort of then a corporate slash worker viewpoint, then a consumer, and then a service provider, let's say. So somebody using the props in her work that are produced, you know, on the receiving end. And what, you know, what I wanted to do when I was, you know, researching this work, the, the methodology was very, in a way, journalistic in, in the sense that a lot of it is like talking to people, going around and, uh, you know, a lot of listening, talking to the right people, getting access, et cetera. And it was, it was super, super interesting. And, you know, a lot of the voiceovers, even in the staged um, scenes, are kind of almost entirely lifted, actually, from a kind of, from interviews, um, sometimes almost verbatim with people. So, like, for example, um, if we have, you know, the guy with the, the consumer, or whatever you want, the consumer activist, let's say, in scene four, there, when he's talking about his friend Jack McGeorge, this is actually, you know, you can Google it, it's public information, it's, um, the, his whole story is super interesting and super true. I mean, he was this guy who was this, went to Iraq, um, was a weapons inspector, and, you know, and uh, there was an attempt in some of the conservative media to kind of try and smear him and therefore discredit the inspection program and Kofi Annan and Hans Blick did, Blix did come out and kind of publicly say, you know, it's his private life, it's got nothing to do with his professional life, etc. And it, you know, but when working on, working on the piece, that even if that's all factual and taken, of course, from true life, me, you know, me as an artist, I of course decide which stories go into the final video. So what I wanted to do with this piece is set up five sort of, you can say, conflicts. The relations between these five view, uh, positions are economic relations, clearly, and they're relations of conflict. So for, and the two easiest pe positions to kind of vilify would of course be the entrepreneur and the consumer. So, but what interested me with this particular, I mean, there's a couple of factories, but this particular one interested me because this owner was actually from a poor background. And so there were certain class issues there where, okay, this was not this person's first choice um, of, you know, career, first choice would have preferred computers or what, what have you. And so there were certain, let's say, obstacles, including, um, political structures that this individual had to overcome. And yet what interested me was how little he, how that did not lead to any kind of solidarity or, or you know, um, in the sense that he thought it was great that, you know, unions were banned and blah, blah. So certain structures which, which oppressed him and which continued to oppress him, that in his personal, um, 
through growing up, that did not lead to any kind of broader or immediate kind of sense of solidarity. This really interested me because I, I, wanted, I wanted to use this factory also as a model. It's, of course, about this particular industry, but it's also a, some, about something more than that. Um, the second, the consumer, you know, what was interesting when talking to people who are clients, there were two things, right? Um, first, it was, you know, there was uh, one of the words that kept popping up. You know, I could have been very stereotypical and, and which I, you know, as I said, I choose what goes in the final video, even if it's all factual, right? So I could have taken a viewpoint of some guy who's like, you know, um, true but very stere stereotypical. At the same time, I'm a businessman. I live in the suburbs. I have 2.2 kids. I work on Wall Street and I go to Penn Station and I, during my lunch hour or near Penn Station and, you know, get, have my sessions. Um, and you can, plenty of stories like that. But what interested me, there was other stories, um, the more you spoke to people, the clients and also uh, service providers, um, which was is the word that kept popping up was community. And this really interested me because these five relations for me, as I said, are economic relations and relations of conflict. And of course, for me, for consumption, what's interesting, and as we know in contemporary society, the self and the, and the experience of the self is, is unfolds in acts of consumption increasingly. The self is articulated and experienced through successive acts of consumption. But these people did not see themselves as, cons as consumers. And a lot of the people saw themselves as a community and a marginalized community. And the discourse was much more like a civil rights discourse. They saw themselves particularly within the line of the feminist movement and more than that, the gay liberation movement in the sense that it was another, it was an alternative, alternative misunderstood sexual, marginalized sexuality. So for me, it's very important you know, with the viewer like, and the way I work with politics, there's a clear political line um, at the same time, I don't want to make, I don't like setting up kind of, you know, paper tigers. I don't like making the, the job, the choices for the viewer easy. So, and what, by what I, by that, what I mean is that, um, I like throwing wrenches into the system rather than having easy choices. So you have somebody who's quite articulate and, and quite smart and talking about Jack McGeorge and see, as I said, seeing themselves in within a, as community members of a community and within a marginalized perspective. And that kind of shifts what the stereotype would be. And so, so as I said, it isn't that there isn't a politics because for example, if you start unpacking, and this is what's interesting and that's why I had it kind of this five viewpoints on this kind of very individual kind of level because everybody seems, I find has you know tunnel vision also just in my life and when I go through life in general or talk to people, what seems to be rational and kind of makes sense within a certain system that people are operating in, you know, can have consequences, often disastrous, for people who are maybe tangential to that system. In this case, for example, the whole Jack McGeorge thing, I mean, these people really thought, and they saw it as an important victory that, you know, this guy went to Iraq and, um, you know, and, you know, they didn't question his mental state and not being able to tell fantasy from reality. And of course, I can understand that there's a certain kind of mainstream acceptance that is important. And I can understand being trying to be, you know, vilified and scapegoated by the Bush administration is not fun. And, you know, that you have, Kofi Annan standing up for you, yeah, the great. On the other hand, when he talked, yeah, and you know, of course you could tell fantasy from reality, blah, blah, blah. Um, if we think about role play and fantasy and reality, the whole Iraq weapons inspection thing was a farce. That was a role play. And talk about fantasy from reality. I mean, the whole country couldn't tell fantasy from reality, right? WMD. So there was an inability to understand a kind of, how should I say, a, a more bird's eye perspective. And that's what I wanted to do in this piece, set these people or set these voices in relationship to each other so that individually everyone's kind of very rational or seems to make sense. And, you know, of course, if you're trying to, um, move through the class system, then this is completely rational. And of course, in the society, you're not going to tell people. It's, you're risking life and limb. You're not going to tell your workers what it is they're doing. I mean, fine, makes sense. Of course, it makes sense that Jack McGeorge went and to Iraq. But the whole system, the, what makes sense with that individual position leads to a total systemic um, br chaos and breakdown. Um, so this was something that really, really interested me. And as I said, um, 
was something uh, I, w I wanted to work with. The other thing was, um, you know, there's two things. This piece has been shown a lot in a lot of these kind of art and economy exhibitions, art and capitalism. And, you know, I, and I'm, you know, that's fine. And I've been in some of them and great, blah, blah. But one of the things that I noticed in some of these exhibitions, I mean, it's really ghastly, um, is that a lot of them are so, so dry. And I find it appalling that, you know, anybody can talk about economy and capitalism without talking about desire. You know, this is something that I found really, really bizarre. And that's also another reason I wanted to do this um, piece. It was really a great way to, to, to talk about um, role play, fantasy, the unconscious, and in, but in a structural way, not as like individual private fantasies and what they could or could not mean, but rather really look at in a very, yeah, as I said, very systematic way from um, history in terms of its effect on sexuality. Like for example, the scene five, it's a role play interrogation scene. And it's super interesting because since 9-11, immediately in the immediate post 9-11 context, you know, any, there's certain roles that always come up. It's always like uh, nurses, as she says, nurses, school teachers, and prison warden or interrogation things. But post 9-11, it suddenly switched to like Guantanamo role plays, right? This was very like big. Um, and so this kind of links, as I said, really interested me. And also um, bringing in, you know, somebody interested in feminism and gender, the links to body, the working class has, of course, traditionally been imaged as male, but it's women doing most of the, um, labor, uh, so world's labor. So this, as I said, these are all these uh, things that were really important to bring in. Um, and I found it very often kind of very, very kind of, you know, not enough emphasis on all the economy, desire, gender, politics, biopolitics. So this is the kind of, um, yeah, this at my interest. The other thing, of course, but this, you know, there was a lot of discussions again in the art world on immaterial labor, material labor, post-Fordism, blah, blah, and uh, super interesting. Um, but for me, and I mean, I, you know, what was really important to articulate through this piece um, was that for me, the link between, let's say, Fordism and post-Fordism, you know, the post in post-Fordism, it's not a temporal uh, indicator. It's not about time that once we had that and now we have that. It's spatial, right? There's probably more factories now than ever before. And this is also what I wanted to kind of bring up in this piece. You have two kinds of labor, right? You have a service or affective labor of the woman in scene five. And then, of course, you have the very physical kind of classic kind of um, manual labor uh, also performed by women. And one quick thing, and then I think I'm, I, we can open the floor, right, in the interest of time. Um, one quick thing, you know, sometimes people are like, so um, the calling, they kept calling the women, one or two people, critics or whatever, prostitutes. And actually, just, let's just be very clear, particularly in the U.S., um, outside of Las Vegas, you cannot provide sexual services, so they're not prostitutes, it's role play services. I mean, they, they would be, you'd be shut down immediately, particularly in the US as a brothel if you did that. I mean, it's, and you would be sh shutting down what for the owners is a very lucrative um, income. So they're very, very careful about that. So it's not about prostitution or even about actual the actual act, but much more, as I said, about role play and these kinds of, uh, for me, the interest in the way some of these historical structures penetrate and infiltrate people's um, fantasies and, and desires. Um, I think I'll, we can, should we stop? Because it's about time, right? Yeah, just to open up the thing. I think I've done enough. I think this is supposed to come on now. Oh, there. <laughs> That's on. Um, so Shari and I talked about this, and we would like to keep this rather informal and not have, especially me as a moderator, not speak very much. So I'm wondering, Shari, actually, if you have any immediate reactions to what's just been presented, given your research. Yeah. Um, I first want to say thank you, Marianne. This is amazing. Um, lecture you were given, and that's every time I watch the uh, Avalon, it's I see something new, which is very, very interesting. Um, and I want to congr congratulate.
congratulate to Ganaminas and Amanda for hosting this um, amazing series of the lecture and very happy for to be part of this. Um, I do see a lot of interest between your research and mine, which I'm interested in the labor condition in the artistic practice um, and contemporary production logic of art. So, um, and you're interested in labor within the post forest economy. So my question, I want to open up with the questions um, to ask you, um, in what condition or situation this work was produced? Was it produced for a biennial? Was it produced for an exhibition in mind? Was it, you know, I, I, I think it always matters a lot for a piece of art to, to understand the circumstances around it. So I just want you to kind of elaborate. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and I will say my interest, you know, I work, for me, it's very hard, uh, let me just pa um, start by saying, for me, it's very hard to work on a piece if I'm not, don't have an immediate personal connection. Mm -hmm. So with the Getty versus Ghana, for example, right, um, copyright, image rights, mm -hmm. you know, this immediately affects artists who work with found footage. And, it, and initially, before it even became a piece, I was like, this is insane. Who I just I have the rights to this image. I paid the f my five dollars. I got the copyright, you know, stamp. And and but but Getty was hardcore and obsessive about copyright, and they, and they really hunt people down. Mm -hmm. um, they're known for that, particularly them. Um, I didn't want them coming after me, and I was like, my God, what am I going to do? You know, like how does that work? So and with Avalon, um, the conditions of ar artist labor, and particularly as a woman artist and labor is something that super, super interests me. Um, so I had immediately, a, and as this particular, the piece Avalon was commissioned by a, for an exhibition by a fantastic organization called Picture This in Bristol in the UK. And I'll, I'll tell you something funny. In 2011, I did it, and the day we were shooting the f downstairs, Upstairs, the office people, well, I, I, yeah, I can say it now, the people were crying. And what it, there was like tears. And what had happened was when that, the, their new government that voted, got voted in, the conservatives that just got re-elected, um, that they're so, ins they're like tea partiers, right? They make the US government look good. And what happened was that they um, had just made huge austerity cuts to culture. And that day, the organization found out that their funding had been oh. cut. And, and they'd commissioned me, they'd commissioned a very nice Hito Steihal piece, an Emily Wardale piece. I mean, there was like, they'd done a ton of commissions. And what was great about them was the working conditions were really good. You got a fee, you got tons of in-kind support. I mean, it was fab, and a lot of women were um, supporting. And I asked the director, I said, oh, you have a lot of women this year. And they were like, oh, I don't, we didn't plan that. We just picked the best artists. I was like, oh, <laughs> there you go. We weren't thinking of that. So um, it's a great question. So yeah. The whole thing around it, I was thinking. So it was commissioned first, and then you kind of giving the structure of the institution, and then you think about a project to approach this commission? Yeah, I'd already wanted, I was mm -hmm. thinking along these lines, but I wasn't, you know, but when they came to me, I kind of, the way I worked is, you know, I worked with a curator, I had a couple of ideas, yeah. and this was the one they found interesting, and that's the one we ran with. Great. Um, I have another question for the voiceovers. Mm -hmm. So there are five different voices, right? Mm, sort of, yeah, sort of. four okay. and a half. Um, <laughs> I think three was subtitles and two are a male and female voice, mm -hmm. English accent. Perhaps? Yeah, British. Yeah, yeah British From accent. Bristol, yeah. Yeah, I'm just interested in your choice of, you know, the pitch in terms of casting the voice, like mm -hmm. the pitch and how you're selecting those voices, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of interesting. Hmm. Um. Uh, oh, I, I, you know, it's, uh, this is going to sound funny because I just gave this very kind of uh, clear speech, but uh, I, I think I approached it quite intuitively, oddly enough. I, you know, it's like auditions, you get a bunch of yeah. tapes and you just, I picked the ones that I thought fit Did you best. see them in person? Like, for me, voice are very visual, actually. Ah, I can okay. kind of, you know, I hear a high-pitched woman, I kind of have an image in my brain. Yeah, like, no. it's interesting. No, just no, no, no. From, from, from like uh, audio show reels and stuff. No, 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 no. I didn't have to meet them. Okay. I mean, I did eventually, but yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. Okay. No problem. I just want to jump in on, on that because uh, there was a lot of discussion in both of these pieces about 
uh, visibility and who gets to control the visibility of certain information or certain actors. And so when you were working with the Getty images, there seemed to be a lot of bringing to light of something. And then with Avalon, there seemed to be a negotiation of anonymity, concealing identities. Mm -hmm. And so if you're sort of a, um, a script writer or a director or even a, a fight choreographer of conflict in your works, how do you negotiate what gets brought to light and what gets concealed? Like, what's, what's your role in that, mm -hmm. in that process? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're mo with Avalon, it's, um, it's interesting because there's actually no faces in the video, right? And what happened was early on there were certain limitations, and I decided to use those limitations. So one of them is that people are not going to, people don't want to talk to cameras, you know, and don't want to be pictured. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, uh, pe people don't want to be pictured. So I decided, and that kind of, so I decided to use secrecy as an invisibility as a theme, mm -hmm. um, because the whole piece is about secrecy and it's exploring that. Getty versus Ghana and the others is very much, I'm working as, um, you know, I'm focusing very much on uh, the, it's bring, as you said, it's bringing information visible. Um, particularly with the African archives, which are offline and fragile. It's very different uh, b when you're dealing with individuals rather than structures. So public archives is different than when you're dealing with individuals and their sexualities. And, and also, like so a lot of my work does, like I have to talk, sometimes I have to talk to people depending on what it is that I've done. And you need to be, you need to negotiate that very carefully in terms of concealing people's identities or revealing what they want and what they don't want. So I did another piece, I won't get into it, but I'm, the guy showed me some images, and then he, chick then he got totally paranoid and um, kind of blew me off, and I never saw or heard from him again. It was very annoying. And um, so I only had, how should I say this, I had a very um, amputated visual information from him. He shared some pictures that he had, he didn't share all of them, and had to work with that limitation. So a lot of my work is about working with limitations, and then of course, you know, to art students, thing is you don't hide it, you use those limitations. They become structuring principles in your root, in your artwork, mm -hmm. you know, rather than trying to hide it and make something that isn't there. So this material was very, dis for example, this material was very choppy. You got a little bit, you know, some people give you a little bit of information, but you didn't have very long stories, so one of the things I did was I made it the whole, like five scenes, they're quite discreet, discreet. they're quite short and kind of choppy. You get kind of, um, yeah, atomistic so, somehow, or discreet. That, that was, and that was um, one of the ways I came around, the fact that it wasn't gonna be like a two hour documentary or one hour documentary. So you use those limitations in your work. Um, just to jump right in, uh, let's get some Respondents yeah. from the audience, and I'm sure Gediminus will jump in whenever he feels appropriate. Yes. Thanks. Um, I enjoyed the talk very much, and I have the privilege of being familiar with your practice. Um, and I think my question is part comment, part question, which is that you often are interested in, say, in the first work, it's the glitches, the errors, the variances, the things that you know cannot be completely accounted for. In the second work, still, it's again like th this particular, what you call a breakdown um, of, a, of a certain system. Yet at the same time, like the part of your formal aesthetic, both with these two works and other works, um, is highly rational and it's sort of if we're talking philosophy in this Kantian sense, no, like it's extremely rational, it's ordered, it's measured, it's distanciated, it's calculated, it's precise, um, and you also in the manner within which you sort of speak about that. And I'm wondering if it is possible for you to maybe reflect a little bit on that particular language that you choose that pre preferences the rational over uh, maybe um, a more chaotic presentation of sorts. You know, I, I don't know how that would be, I mean, if that's really possible, but it would be nice as a sort of a start of a conversation to sort of think, or maybe you can locate maybe within another work, a moment in which this sort of rational um, dissipates in, and allows something else to appear. Yeah, I mean, that's a, 
it's a good question. I mean, it's an interesting question. What I would say is that um, I think it's about affinity, you know, and I think I'm absolutely not against the rational at all. Um, you have to, <laughs> particularly in the U.S. context, I mean, you know, the kind of academics, what I studied was very much, there was a lot of critique of the enlightenment and reason and, the, and rationality, which came from in a very particular, uh, you know, if you read very particular theorists, and I think that whole critique was and is extremely important. But I always felt, you know, particularly growing up in the States, that there's, um, there's so much distrust of knowledge, actually, and of rationality. I mean, you have people who don't believe in evolution, don't believe in global warming, don't believe in, you know, basic facts like that, that, and that um, everything's opinions and stuff, that actually I felt that um, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of these who's kind of working in that sense with the irrational. So for me, this kind of ordered, measured approach, maybe it's a reaction to that, maybe it's affinity, I tend to work my stuff a lot, you know, and it tends to be very kind of controlled. Sometimes people have said, oh, I'd like to see you more da-da-da, but it somehow has, has never happened. And maybe that's because I actually, I don't know if you want to call it didactic, but I actually do like to make like very clear um, standpoints in my work somehow. Um, so I think that's, I'm guessing that's where it kind of comes from. Plus, I find um, in the information age where people are so filled and overloaded with information that I find chaos and accumulation and kind of dispersion, I actually find it politically and formally, but also politically super problematic, actually. So I prefer things that are very distilled and very kind of minimal, even if there's a lot behind them, because I feel this overconsumption of, I mean, I think there's some statistic that the average person now consumes X amount more of bytes of information than five, 10, 15 years ago. So I actually find precision and like less and short and it's kind of more, also politically forms are political in this particular day and age, somehow more strategically valuable. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question over there, Neil. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering if you, this is on a similar line, I was wondering if you could actually talk about uh, the notion of uh, the storyboard mm -hmm. and the title of your piece and its relation to um, sort of like the creation of a socio-political narrative in the work, like developing the background and what the relationship between this kind of like rational way of presenting information, um, potentially, I mean, along those lines of the last question and how that relates to the idea of a storyboard Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I should mention the title <laughs> was actually, um, you know, it's, it's, it kind of works for a lot of my pieces. Um, it did, it was meant to be for the earlier work, the Independence Day work, which you know and which you know. Um, but then in the interest of time, I kind of decided not to show, discuss that work. And it's, I will say it's a piece that I have shown at this point 18 times, so I'm also kind of tired of that particular work. Um, and that formally is kind of going between storyboard and grid. Um, in this particular case, I think for me, it's, um, for me, uh, how should I explain this? The grid for me has uh, always been very interesting. It's this uh, very rational, as you said, process, um, structure, Rosalind Krauss has written about the grid and it being emblem the emblematic kind of um, structure of modernism. Um, and for me, storyboard has been about excess, flow, narrative, and somehow I oscillate between these two points. Um, and sometimes th it can be quite different. Like, um, so if you look at the first piece, the Getty versus Ghana and all that, it's, um, you know, I wouldn't call it, ra you can call it rational, but it's also using certain artistic, I'm very interested in art history and in lineage, right? And when I do a piece, I think either at the beginning or maybe even at the end, I come up like where does this kind of, what is the lineage? So for something like Getty versus Ghana, where you're dealing with provenance and you're dealing with ownership, one of course thinks of Hans Hacke, for example, right? Major influence on me and not in terms of my interest in institutional critique, which is not something I'm actually interested I mean, I am, but it's not something I do, but rather more in the unpacking of economic structures. It's for me, and 
is very, super, super interesting. And I was very inspired by Hakka's, um, Manet's asparagus piece, right, which I love, actually, when I did the Getty versus Ghana. And for me, uh, as, as I said, that is very much within that line. I found the language of, cons of to some extent, con not just Hakka, but some other, also others, of conceptual art, very fitting that particular form, uh, that partic what I wanted to say. So I saw that much more within a particular lineage. For Avalon, you know, I studied literature and theater. Um, I also get bored. I do one p do work in one medium, and then I want to change things up. In Avalon, there was you can it was um, much more like a storyboard um, in the sense that I kind of literally make these storyboards. It's very important for me. Like when I shoot, um, it's partly budget reasons. Uh, you, I have to always like be very precise, or, or it's just personality. I always have very strict storyboards, very shot down to each shot. I have it mapped out. Um, so it's so in this. So it's about my working method, I would say, and it kind of oscillates between these two poles, between narrative and stories, which the grid generally or traditionally has not um, been most utilized for. And then this kind of very ordering and structuring of what seems to be a chaos and a huge morass of information, which is my interest in the grid. Um, yeah. So it goes in between. Mm. <coughs> What an idea. Go for it. Yeah, it's, it's rustling. It's all yours. I guess it's a good, uh, I kind of want to boomerang back to the question that Zhao asked about the voice. Because mm -hmm. um, I can, it's definitely really palatable, all the structure that you have in the work and the visual forms. But it is interesting to me, um, I'm interested in your ideas about the aesthetics of consuming the voice. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about, I assume, the capital S self and consumption, mm -hmm. the self and desire, and um, I believe in kind of a train of thought that the voice is always digested aesthetically. You know, you could make a, a the, it's the object of desire, perhaps. In this particular work you're talking in about? In always, whenever you hear a human voice, mm -hmm. you're aestheticizing it. Um, so when you're kind of having an affinity choosing these voices, mm -hmm. um, what's going on in the back of your mind? Um, because um, it seems kind of, um, interesting that you've got a lot of controlled grid-like interest but in terms of the acousmatic sound um, it seems to be a little more playful and, and you're picking the people that are going to represent the pseudo archetypes they're not particularly archetypal mm -hmm. but um, they do have a, a, a sonic resonance that we hear mm -hmm. I mean again it's it's yeah when you ask about you know as I said it's I have to say it was it was uh, intuitive. I, I'm not sure in the sense it's just what felt right. I started with the text. I always start with text, always. Um, then image and the voice actually came last. Mm. Um, also, I will say, well, this is funny, but um, I normally work a lot with dialogue. Mm. Actually, I work a lot with actors um, in for videos. Like scene view or dialogue, dialogue or depends. Dialogue. Depends. Just depends on the piece. Um, and what I like to do is I like to change things. So I also, I mean, I saw why I made Avalon, but I was like, well, I haven't done a voiceover in a while, but um, I should do one at some point. I also like to change one element just to keep things interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd done a piece earlier with voiceover, and I, if I were to be critical. Uh, you know why not? I think it became it was it was a little too ponderous and a little yeah. too this. And in these, I, I but I still like some of that. I love Derek Jarman's Blue. I mean, that's a brilliant right. use of voice. That's film. A brilliant use of silence. Too. Of silence <laughs> and voice. Um, so in this one, I think I tried to cast voices that were a little somewhat stylized, but also like with the way I work with actors, somewhat stylized, somewhat theatery. Theater is a big influence theatrical, but at the same time, you know, so some distance to the text, mm. somehow it's being recited, it's not really being performed as an I. These are all things that recur throughout my work, also with actors very often. There's a kind of a theatrical, kind of staged or posed element. And this had it, the, la the English speakers had that to, to some to some extent. And I, it's a kind of a distance, almost like they're not the people that you see on the screen, they're kind of 
outside or kind of observing yeah. that. But that was interesting too, and it was also interesting that you had this kind of effective quality to it, because the way that we heard the sound, we could hear the receiver sometimes when they were talking into the microphone that was being recorded. And that was a really interesting move that I saw. That you really took you away that this is not the person, you know? And you can really think of the form of digesting a female voice, or digesting a human voice, or a voice that's not mid-Atlantic dialect. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I was really, I'm really glad you shared that with us. Yeah, th thank you very much, very nice presentation. Uh, one thing I was wondering about this photo I didn't quite understand. I beg your pardon? The photo here, what the relationship ah, yeah, to yeah, the yeah. And secondly, uh -huh. did you visit those archives and what was the impression of Africa and their interest in their heritage and yeah. the resources they put into it sort of? Oh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. You know, the, this photo, okay, this is from Tanzania. There is another work I have, right? It's called Independence Day, 1934 to 1975. <laughs> I have shown it 18 times. <laughs> I swear. And it's an ongoing piece since 2009. And in the interest of time, I, I thought when I first came, you know, when they contacted me and said, you need to do your title because we're going to print our poster. I was like, <laughs> okay, well, I, that's a piece, you know, why, why not present that? Me and Gediminas were in a show together and I showed it. So that, so that, so I sent those images and I sent that piece. And then later on, I was like, what? you know, I should show, show my more diversity, more diversity and stuff. So let me show a range of works because it's to students and you want to, you know, open it up and people are working in different ways. So this particular image is from the Ministry of Information in Tanzania. Um, there are 30 archives that I have worked with, public archives, in, their, in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. If you're talking about specifically about Sub-Saharan Africa, it really depends on the country in terms of the state of the archives. Okay, Mozambique, for example, where there's a revolution and there's, this, there's a party, which is a political party, which is still in power, Felimo, you know, they have brilliant archives. I mean, everything is really, and very controlled though, but they, they have fabulous archives. If you're talking, and Tanzania, for example, odd, and, and Kenya, oddly enough, have, you know, they're not online, but they have fantastic images that you get from the negative, and their negatives are in pretty good shape, actually. And then there are countries that you think would be very good at conserving their histories, and that are not, like India. I mean, they've got the money, but you should see the state of those archives. Um, so it's interesting. It, 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 de it depends on the country. Um, and that's a whole other interesting question. With, I think, with the state of the African archives, as I said, you know, it's a, there was a couple of stereotypes. Because when I first started the piece, the Independence Day, as I said, people were like, oh, I think there's very little there. I think there's much more here, you know, and what can you find there, blah, blah, blah. And um, that turned out not to be the case. But the thing is, in, these co in, in a lot of these countries, people themselves don't know what's there. So for example, on the 50th anniversary of Ghanaian independence, 2007, you know, people were blogging, because especially Getty versus Ghana and that whole body of work, really, as I said, looks at archive not past, but in terms of future, in terms of digitalization and ownership of information. And that, what was very interesting was that in 2007, people were blogging and they were like, yay, you know, it's our independence in Ghana, right? Bloggers online, you know, it's, uh, we're independent, blah, blah, blah. And then they were linking, the images they were linking to were on the Getty website. Mm. So they themselves didn't know or didn't care or did not, you know, concern themselves with the fact that some of those same images were in their um, own country's archives. And, um, and, and the, the, other, the other thing is, of course, these random bloggers, they, weren't, they couldn't afford to pay Getty, so they linked to the copyrighted image, like the one with the watermark on it. So it was, uh, that was uh, super, super interesting. But as I said, it really depends on the country, and that's a whole nother dis discussion. <laughs> uh, related to this question, uh, why you didn't try to find the truth about the caption related to the, the case Ghania versus Getty. Mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, the caption didn't... Match. Yes, didn't match. Why you mm -hmm. didn't try to find the truth? Um, because I was very interested in this particular thing. I took a very kind of, how should I say this, a detached, the tone is quite detached of the piece. And actually, I was more interested in the contradiction and the relations between these two 
and what they said. And also, there, it's quite difficult to figure out what, who would actually, um, it's not something you can definitively prove so easily. You could talk to certain historians, and they could have certain ideas and stuff, but it's, 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 actually, it's not actually that easy to prove or disprove. Because Kenya, you know, what people told me is they could have their own reasons. I don't know what, but they could have their own reasons for changing certain things. And um, so just because it's coming from there, that authority doesn't necessarily mean that it is the, uh, the correct one. On the, on the other hand, as I said, but my interest more particularly was in the slippage between the two and what could. Yeah, and as I said, it's not actually easy to definitively prove at, at all. Um, because it, the, a lot of the Independence Day, that one day, there's, there could be multiple swearing in ceremonies it could have been one of them, and then they could have gone to the stadium. It's, it's, it's quite tricky to know, actually. Jessica? Um, I want to, okay. I want to ask more about the idea of secrecy and visibility that we were already discussing. Uh, actually, thinking about the faces within the video, uh, Avalon, we do actually see the faces. We see the faces of the workers. Mm -hmm. And the only place where uh, and in a way, also the worker secrecy is something important, but also at the same time, it's a bit abeyant, it's buried, because they, they to them, is the idea of, in a way, the whole politics of, uh, we know what we're doing, but we don't talk about it, or the whole thing. So, but also I was thinking about the idea of, uh, for instance, when, uh, when, you, when you talk about the, the person who was responsible for the Iraq, uh, for who was responsible for the war in Iraq, and the idea of the person who was, I forgot his name. Uh, George, who was yeah. on the weapons inspections team, yes. the UN yes. weapons inspector, yes. yeah. And this whole idea also, this whole relation with the, like, the economies of desire and the idea of bodies also manufacturing things for other bodies to wear, not for themselves. And I saw there is something super interesting in here when when basically his his friend is talking about him, there's like the witness as if who is someone close, but is like a friend. So there's again this idea of intimacy. But he says that the argument they use is that he was actually already out. So as if this how in a way this reinfor uh, reinforces this normalization of violence. But here we're talking about another violence, which is also which is is it intimate or not? Also thinking about war and its relationship to intimacy and what's happening. So maybe I would, I would be interested if you could talk more about this and also thinking about this para paralleling between um, that, I, I, I don't know, I saw it myself a little bit about the idea also of the entrepreneur, but then this whole idea of community and the normalization that happens, the idea of a community, we are a community, but we are a community here. We still work on uh, excluding certain bodies there, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you could talk more about these points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, what happened was with, um, uh, brr, with in terms of the community, as you said, you know, this was, you have to remember, this is around the time of, uh, what is that book that everybody reads? Shades of Grey? What is it? Fifty <laughs> Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey, right? And there was this kind of, you know, Econ the economy, the margins are always the new kind of fetish or the new center, right? So every sexuality at some point, short of pedophilia, as he more or less says, is it can be commodified, fetishized, produced, specu specula spectacularized. Um, this happened a little bit, this, the whole Jack with George thing was a little bit earlier than that. Um, and yeah, he, um, how should I say this? It, he was already out. What happened was he'd written, he, as I said, those, those committees that he was on, which have these very bizarre bureaucratic names, they're all real. I mean, it's actually a letter, Leadership Council and National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. There's this weird kind of libertarian, sexual libertarian kind of uh, vibe, part right wing, part left wing, um, that's kind of within this community. Um, and as you said, that rests on certain kinds of exclusions as well. Um, and there's a kind of uh, self kind of, you know, even when you spoke to those people, they were like, well, who are you? And are you one of us? And, you know, and I'm not going to, I don't bring my personal life in, so I'm not going to tell you what I answered. But, you know, it's like, where are you from? And, and people would not talk to you until they kind of 
figured out. So there was a very much a mentality of separatism somehow, um, which I found interesting. Um, the workers don't speak in this video, and this is because just in practical terms, it's you, one cannot get access. Um, one was, it, I was not able to get access. It's as simple as that. Um, and that's what I mean when you do work like this, your, your, your video, it's not just, you know, you're not just writing a script from, you know, when you're researching out in the real world, you will be coming up against constant roadblocks and you somehow have to use them or work around them. So I cannot just run around factories with my own camera, right? I got very heavily censored, very discreet footage, very little of it, um, and I had to work with that. And I also, as I said, was not having access to anybody working on the thing. So I, as I said, I, I, have to, I had to find ways around it. Um, and in a way, I think, I also think, um, I'm not sure, it, it actually, oddly enough, you can, you know, I'm not sure in a way, it would also feel somewhat exploitative to have the workers uh, somehow, I mean, is it, their voices are there, should, should they be represented, should they not be represented, I'm not sure, just by giving them a voice and giving them a space, let's say I was, best of all worlds, um, allowed access, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I would have, wanted it represented. There's a sense of, because they were not totally aware of the final context of the work and there's a kind of a hierarchy and a power there that I'm not sure with the best of intentions one could overcome. Mm, I don't know, it's a tricky Actually, one. We could see, in, uh, we could see in pl some places their faces but we yeah, cannot absolutely. hear their voice. So yeah. in a way to me this is like, it's as if like yeah, yeah. very Im the most important frame within the whole video. Yeah, that we could see. Th and what are you doing as an artist mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. allowing us to see mm -hmm. the factory in the daylight mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not allowing us to mm -hmm, hear mm -hmm. their voices and yep. also having this detachment? Mm -hmm. It's like role playing being role played again, this mm -hmm. double role playing. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. what is happening in here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, with art, I mean, you know, my relationship between art and ethics is not. Um, is, is, is troublesome and there are certain ways um, where you will, uh, for better or worse, um, in one scene or in one level reproduce certain structures. So let's say the voicelessness of the workers and their spectacularization, their imaging. On the other hand, you have one, you find other ways, other scenes within the video to kind of work against that or to equalize it. But the reason you have that, let's say, hearing the workers is then I would have had to fictionalize it. It's as simple as that, or not do the piece. And same with the footage, it's like, this is what you get. On the other hand, I liked, um, I actually thought, you know, in our contemporary, you can also look at it the other way, right? In our contemporary society, there's actually very few images of labor, actually. Um, one just doesn't see it. One never gets inside a Nike factory or this factory or that factory, actually. They want the, despite the proliferation of images in today's world, the, the, there's some certain very sealed off places. One are slaughterhouses. I mean, seriously, right? Because <laughs> I've been working with food, so I know this. And the others are factories, right? So animals and the way they're treated and then workers. And so to give it a kind of visibility, particularly women workers, you know, you could also read it the other way, that it's okay within the context of the thing. But often when you're doing this kind of work, as I said, there are no easy solutions. And you will make certain choices, which, as I said, you need to stand by. I'm, now I'm talking to students. But that ethically, of course, um, have different, mm, you know, on one sense can seem progressive, on another sense can seem problematic. I'm wondering, actually, is that, oh wait, is there another question? Go for it, Ram. Yeah, yeah, take it away. So, uh, it's great, great talk so far. And this question might not be um, so related to the last question, but you're mentioning labor a lot, and um, you mentioned uh, Hans Hake and his work on institutional critique and the asparagus painting. And it's a role that I, I question a lot too, like the, the art role as a place of labor. And you guys were mentioning a, li a little bit with Shari about artist labor, and mm -hmm. you've seen a lot of places. You've been around and seen a lot of artists working in different contexts. So I was wondering if you ever turned the lens back, uh, not so much on yourself, but starting off with yourself, perhaps, and then what kind of structures do you see uh, that might be current or more of today, and where are the limits of 
you know, um, you know, rights of the artist worker or creative worker. So I see fashion people and people who do this kind of sewing also as creative workers. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, there's, uh, I keep repeating myself, but there's a lot of really good questions and, you know, um, uh, phew. You know, I think it's artist labor, it's super, super, super important. Um, it's, it's a fantastic question. There's certain things I do on a very practical level. Very simply, I have, <laughs> I have a standard four or five lines on my email of um, asking for artist fees. I really insist on that. There are groups such as Wage, Working Artists in the Greater Economy, that are working actively on this. Um, and I fo follow them or quite carefully. Um, and then in terms of conditions of labor, art, artist labor, you know, it's absolutely, I think it's absolutely dire, um, the situation, particularly for, for women artists, I would say. I mean, we're marginalized twice over, because if you look at biennials and stuff, it's about 30% representation, 30% women. If you look at galleries, let's say, which is where artists are supposed to get their money from, it's like 90% male. Even, and I'm talking my generation, right? I'm not talking about the old guys. Um, so it's, su it's super, super problematic. And when you do think, when you go to art school, you know, or, and you, or you do this, things like the Whitney program or whatever where you're taught to be critical, one of the things you're not allowed to be critical towards is actually your own position. And it's super, it's super, super problematic. It's like a don't ask, don't tell. You know you're gonna be broke when you leave here. But if, you, if, we, if we tell you that too much, we're not gonna get enough applicants and then we're not gonna get enough money. The admins, not, we're not gonna be making the money we need because the big, we need to sell you need to sell that, that this might be your ticket. I'm not saying every school, and I'm not talking about that, but from the ad, <laughs> no, 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 but th this, is my this is my experience. This is my experience, right? You're asking me Betray personally. You. Huh? We trust you. Yeah, 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 this is, this is my experience, right? Um, and uh, maybe I've just picked the wrong schools. <laughs> and, um, and also, and same, and as I said, the same at the Whitney program. And uh, so what you had, like, for example, at the, Art Academy in Vienna, right? Venerable place, right? You know, Hitler applied, didn't get in, and um, great place. He, they, they started this artist PhD program, right? And it, well, I won't say who it was, but it was like certain theorists and very well known, and they're all very critical. And this is about teaching artists how to be critical, right? You're supposed to do a PhD, and we're gonna help you, and uh, it's all about teaching you how to, you know, be critical towards society and global conditions of labor and all that. And da da da. And uh, by the way, you have to self-fund it yourself. And but we'll all be paid. The professors or the you know the, the the admin everybody gets paid and then here you sit there and we're gonna you know we're gonna supervise your thesis as an artist you're gonna be doing more labor it's a, a mo more la unpaid labor and it it's about teaching you how to be critical because it had this so-called cri critical Whitney program ish kind of cast to it that's about economy and blah blah so this whole this whole paradox but what I find is that people don't discuss it enough there's just a total stonewalling and I find it super problematic. Um, and as and the other thing, um, what, what was the uh, recently? And when, uh, as I said, and when when you try and discuss it, you'd be surprised how much censorship and self censorship, or maybe not surprised, there there is within the art world. But there are things, as I said, that um, you can do, as I said, which is you know, get more, ask every time for artist fees and per diems and decent kind of conditions. Um, and I've I'm quite kind of tough on that, actually, uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Do we have anyone else <coughs> in the audience with burning questions? There's some really good things raised. Um, again, Venus. <laughs> thank you. Um, Marian, thank you, first of all, for a compelling uh, presentation and, and really a uh, talk that that as you can see, you know, it is, it is pretty ob obvious, you know, it brought, uh, it brought a great uh, intellectual energy. So thank you for that. Um, I had another question. Um, uh, in your, in your uh, opening slides, uh, you were showing the shot of the installation that was part of the uh, pavilion uh, in Venice Benale this year, right? Which is still on, right? Um, and, uh, and that shot is a fragment of the larger complex work. Uh, your work uh, is complex by itself. 
And as you were mentioning that, you know, the work that you've been showing like 15 times or, or 18 times you mentioned, um, and I wonder um, if we just kind of like, you know, extrapolate, if we just look at this particular instance uh, uh, at, the, at the Belgian pavilion, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you could just kind of like a little bit talk about that, mm -hmm. how, how that complexity of yours, you know, is being uh, installed in this uh, another complexity, another kind of like la larger context, right? Of that pavilion you're talking about. Of that about. pavilion, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, what proximities, you know, it builds, you know, and uh, just kind of like if you could mm -hmm. just speak about, about sure, that, sure. Uh, as this could be extremely interesting in terms of those two uh, um, kind of um, two different type of uh, ontologies in a way stacked on each other. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you were there, right? You, you went, okay. I didn't see you, but you, you've seen the pavilion. Yeah. That's what, okay, that's, okay. So the Belgian pavilion this year, it's a group show. There are 11 artists. They paid a very good artist fee, which I'm very happy with, um, and good working conditions. Um, <laughs> and um, that my piece, as I said, is one of the contributions. Um, and that work, what happened was that year, it's been co-curated by Vincent Missen, um, a Belgian artist, very interesting work he has in the pavilion, and Katarina Gregos. And um, they invited sort of, Vincent got, kind of got the pavilion, you like apply and, apply and then a selection board makes it, they do like an open call, like kind of a kind of democratic, you know, in Belgium kind of, process allegedly anyone can apply so Vincent applied he got it and his methodology is he's an artist but he also works a lot as a curator and um, and he invited Katarina Gregos to kind of co-curate the pavilion with him and it was focusing particularly it was called person et les autres person someone and no one I don't quite know how to translate that in English no one and others huh? no one and other person person no is one. Someone and no one, persons yeah. and no one, and someone and others, but also no one and others. I mean, yeah, it's kind of like poetic. Anyway, so um, and what happened was that he, his, he um, was studying. He the, the whole Vincent's practice very much is on post-colonial um, Belgian colonial history, very much in particularly in Congo. And um, so they invited certain artists that they had affinities with, uh, uh, artistically, curatorially, like I'd shown with Vincent before and a couple of exhibitions, um, who were working in, s if not similar, but let's say parallel ways or in ways around issues of col colonialism and um, different, different entry points into it. So mine was very much on economy, my piece, um, Vincent, uncovered a very, very interesting um, exam a situationist um, who was living, who African, who was living in Congo now, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the DRC, and, but had, was in Belgium during, the, in, during 68 and was uh, active and quite uh, sort of good friends and active on the whole situationist international movement and was friends with de Boer and also the Belgian situationist Raoul, Raoul Verge, I've forgotten his last name. Anyway, um, so so he uncovered this whole kind of lost history, you can say, of and, and the way that this guy had been written out of, let's say, situationist history. So he was looking at, let's say, minor histories and, peop and the way he had been written out of it. And then, as I said, there were other artists who had done um, from different nationalities, right? So, and this was the first time the pavilion, first of all, it's a group show, which was very unusual, since the pavilion, it's supposed to be, you know, national representation, one person. So first it was a group show, second of all, it's international, and third of all, they had a lot of um, also African artists in it. And this, you know, Belgium, colonial power, but they'd never ever tackled, tackled the topic. Or, as I said, it invited artists from different backgrounds, including from their own colonies, within, um, in the pavilion. So, so I, and I, I like this. So, on multiple layers, I, I was very happy with the, uh, with the um, pavilion. I thought it worked well. And, um, yeah, so within that context, my piece was, as I said, one kind of node or somehow within, as you said, a larger comp 
m more complex um, thing. Um, his Vincent's was the minor histories and situationism. There was another, a lot of it was about people being written, people or things being written out of history, particular, and the relationship between art history, actually, going back to like your question, um, mine did not focus on art history, but a lot of it was on art history and people and minor art histories, the relationship of the avant-garde, I mean the avant-garde and its opposition to the mainstream, whether it's situationists or at certain points key modernists, that was also one of the works in, um, w within Cobra, actually that, that, that um, moment. And what was interesting, these, the way these minor um, kind of, or, or, alternative histories have been historicized. I mean, now they've been historicized. Um, what's happened is they've been presented as these kind of very uniform, very homogenous, homogenous, mostly white male histories. And just by some coincidence, a lot of the women or the African participants or Asian participants have kind of been written out of it. Um, or it's been like what you get like in a standard art history textbook. Oh, they're responding. Oh, they saw this in a picture and then they got inspired. And that rather than seeing it as a kind of a dialogue and an active kind of production uh, kind of uh, yeah as a dialogue between equal participants you know that knowledge flew both um, flowed both ways so that's the larger pavilion was dealing very much with that and when they spoke to me I said listen you know um, I said I think it's really interesting but my em emphasis I said you know you have a lot of you people working on history and uh, some archive pieces. I said, but for me, what's always important, it's I'm not dealing with, let's say, a minor history, but what I, for me, I think this work will fit in and I can um, very well, it's an existing work and that was okay for me and also time-wise, actually, um, I did not have time to make a new work and I said, but I have, I said, you know, one thing that I think you're missing out on is the is again of economics, right? You you have there's a lot of shows on archive or on history and artists working with these issues, and they are not, in my opinion, the, a lot of these exhibitions they're looking at these images, almost, very often almost pictorially, like in terms of what information, uh, what what they are saying about the past or about the history, which is very important, minor histories, but no one's talking about the uh, ownership of this information that people are using and its circulation. And uh, you doesn't, the whole pavilion shouldn't have to be about that because minor histories are worth talking about. But um, I'm also very much interested in who conserves them and who owns them. I mean, my thing is always, as I said, very often taking this kind of economic angle, and so I said, you know, let's, let's in the pavilion as a whole, let's not deal just with content or even form, but also structures. So this, I think that added a nice voice. And yeah, and there was fantastic uh, experience. Mm, yeah. Just to jump on that, I don't know, Zara, if maybe you'll have some thoughts on this as well, but, um, and I know we're, we probably should cut down on time soon, but how do you negotiate? Because what I also see is like there's a process of many frames in that piece. So you had the, your text in a frame, and then yeah. there were these photos without which frames. Which are unframed, yeah. Which are unframed. But then it's being staged under the banner of Belgium. Mm -hmm. So there are these, it, so it's, it's, it seems complicated. And then the, if we're talking about staging, there's also the audiences of the Biennale, the people who are mm -hmm. looking at this information. So mm -hmm. how do you take those things into consideration when engaging in a problem? a project like that and then taking a project you already had and saying, okay, I'll put it under the Belgium frame, mm -hmm. even though these histories and these objects of these histories are claimed by different economic forces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Venice Biennial is a super, <laughs> as you know, a super problematic mm -hmm. structure. Um, and then as an artist, you know, the, when you work as an artist, you will constantly make compromises and you decide as an individual how far into the game you want to be or not. Yeah. It's as simple as that, into the art world. And you decide that for yourself as an individual. For me, Venice, um, I didn't see it as under the banner of Belgium because the whole increasingly, A, I had very, you know, I think for Vincent, it was very much Belgium. He is Belgian. He has a relationship to the country and probably had to, like, you know, shake hands with the ambassador and all that. It's 11 people. You're, it's It felt, for me, more like a group show. And Belgium, it, the pavilion itself somehow, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't mind. They, they deal very little with their colonial history. Um, and I felt it was a, a, an okay format in this context. There was artists from Congo in it. It was a mixed group, also in terms of gender. So I felt we opened it up and made the structure somewhat better. Um, you, there's always a flip side to look at, oh, are you making it better or are you being instrumentalized by it? And this is a, this, as I said, you, even if you think you're being instrumentalized, then you, 
you know, you decide whether you want to or not. And let's, you know, um, in this particular case, because I knew the curator and I knew the artist, they were colleagues and they were peers, the whole thing felt quite comfortable. And the other thing is, you know, everyone's like, oh, Venice, ah, ah, ah. but there's so many biennials and there's so, so much audience that my expectations were not particularly high. Like, as an artist, I was like, oh, now I'm going to be famous. You know, I didn't, <laughs> the, it was an existing work, as you said. I knew the context. They had a very clear statement and what it was going to be. So I knew kind of, and I knew both of them. I worked with them, I had relationships with them. So I kind of trusted them. And they had a good artist fee, so they were, yeah. <laughs> I did it for the money. No, no, no. But you know what I mean is that they were like ethical with yeah. the way they were handling. The, the whole thing was very ethical um, as far as I'm concerned. So I was okay, I was okay with it yeah. in that context. Um, and as I said, I didn't. I was quite relaxed through the whole thing. It was in Venice. I mean, there's so many biennials now. There's so there's so much information. So many artists. It's it's felt for me more just like another exhibition. I don't think it has the same meaning that it used to. Twenty third. This kind of hegemony that it used to. At least not for me. I don't know. Um, thank you for that. Because um, I know many of the students in this program may have aspirations to one day have to make those sorts of decisions and compromises. So to hear your perspective, I think, is potentially helpful and interesting. If there, are there any more questions in the group? Yeah. Um, just to, you had mentioned um, in terms of uh, working in conditions and artist fees that you had like five quick lines in an email or something. Is that, did you say something to that effect? Oh, my standard kind of, yeah, can you, thank you very can much. You, can for you rattle them off? Sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Dear sir, madam, thank you very, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to work with you. It is a pleasure to work with you. I'm uh, very much looking forward to the dialogue as it unfolds. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, as, uh, as an artist, I feel it is extremely important also that, um, art, as you know, my work is dealing with uh, economy, and I also feel within my own life it is very important that artists are remunerated for their labor, even though I understand it is not a large fee, even if it's symbolic, I think even that is um, extremely important, and particularly I rely on, your, on the support of institutions like yours to continue to do what I'm doing, particularly because my work, as you know, is, um, it does not have a huge commercial side to it, um, yours sincerely. Hmm? Huh? What do you mean working conditions? Working conditions meaning like uh, uh, remuneration, meaning artist fee, yeah. Otherwise, the working conditions I, I set myself, an ergonomic chair and, you know, high-speed internet. <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah. I did not send that email to you. You know that. I didn't send it to you. She didn't send the email to me, and I had Although a Although maybe I, I should, should charge you with solo interest. Show <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I mean, the footnote to that, I mean, since we are addressing the issue of artist fees and so on and so forth, I mean, you, there's also, there's also sometimes particular countries and cities that have art institutions that might not be as affluent as other institutions elsewhere. Um, and we do, we, we do also believe that labor is important and also should be compensated also for ourselves. But at the same time, there's maybe other ways, like so it's not always like a sort of a standard, you know, the artist against the world, the world is against the artist. So sometimes, you know, you might actually collaborate with the institution or the curator to actually apply for a grant. So oftentimes, our money as curators comes through artists. It's actually not always a one way, uh, yeah, so one way or the highway type thing. And it's actually sometimes the best institutions to work with are medium scale institutions, really large institutions also can be like really awful with payment, yes, such as like Documenta, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, in Cairo, I mean, I'm not going to... No, but I mean, but in a way, you make it possible, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you fundraise, you find yeah, a yeah, yeah. and you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. She has a microphone. So, <laughs> I was waiting for me to say something. Um, yeah, going back to the, I just want to say kind of the last couple of sentences. Going back to this kind of uh, system of 
economic systems, I think it's very interesting in both of your work that you presented today that has this kind of a globalized economy. For, I think it's especially interesting for the Avalon, actually, there's many um, videos I saw before that is about factories and about the workers' conditions, but yours is first when I actually see the products that are being used to see the consumer of the end. I think that's kind of interesting to see the whole cycle. There is this desire, and then there is this post borders economy. So there is this individualized system. There is this kind of a, you call the marginalized economy. Therefore, there is this specialized goods to produce for them. So I think this is all kind of going back. And for the archives, I think it's interesting um, because you're looking at this system that um, the Getty purchased from whoever owns this archive, and then they are, they copyrighted it, and somehow the person you said f on Facebook that linked it back to Getty and then paid for that, who was from Ghana, that yeah. they want to see their Independence Day images. So it's interesting to see the whole cycle of that going back, and it's I think it, you're totally right. It's, I think we need to be aware of what are be captured and what is <coughs> archived and what is not archived, and how those kind of um, system um, keep going because if they're getting bigger and bigger, um, those smaller institutions would decide, you know, there's no need for us to keep on this archive. We'll just give up and oh, we just donate it to a bigger institution and then therefore they can make decision whether they want to, you know, keep on running this big database or, you know, they can, there's like bigger decisions in their hands and like you said, there's a, um, photograph, um, a history, image-based history that are in their hands. So I think it's very, very important piece. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so let me let me just make a short announcement uh, before before thanking all of you. Um, as it is now time to wrap up, right? So the, uh, so the announcement is about upcoming events in our lecture series. Monday, October 19, 2015, very soon, uh, Rosa Barba on objects and ideas. Uh, Barba's lecture will be moderated by a SMAT candidate, Bjorn Sparman, uh, with response from Hasib Ahmed, uh, who is alumni uh, from our program, uh, now uh, doing PhD at Zurich University, and Henrietta Huldich, uh, MIT list curator, who curated exhibition Rosa Barba, The Color Out of Space, which opens October 22nd uh, this year. Monday, October 26, Marietice Pötrc, Public Space is a Social Agreement. The discussion following Pötrc's lecture will be moderated by SMAT candidate Ron Martin, uh, featuring responses by Anne Winston Spiron, uh, professor at DUSP, uh, and Rebecca Uchel, uh, a graduate from HTC uh, and also researcher at CAST. Uh, um, and for the full list of our lecture series and events, please see our information table, sign up for our mailing list, and visit website ac.mit.edu. So last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, Mariam very much uh, for her uh, really evocative, evocative presentation. And uh, also Gedney and Xiao Rui being uh, wonderful moderators and respondents, thank you. Both uh, also Amanda for helping to prepare and coordinate uh, lecture series, also Marion, uh, Andrew, Madeline, and John. Thank you all very much, and of course, wonderful, Mariam.